I think this is working. Yeah, after almost two years here, I think I've got the hang of talking in a microphone. Okay. Thank you all for coming. This is so exciting. And because we're talking about Native American architecture, I'm going to do a long land acknowledgement. I think that's appropriate. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we gather together on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascades watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Duwamish, Suquamish, Nisqually, Snoqualmie, and Muckleshoot tribes for their enduring care and protection of our shared land and waterways. Okay. <laughs> okay, and now today we are presenting Henry Matthews talking about Native American architecture. What it, did you have another title in the elevator? This'll do. Okay. Well, we all know about Native Americans. Uh, they live in teepees, and uh, that's that's an, that's about enough. I did start researching about 85 years ago, and uh, I still don't know very much compared with what there is to know. The more I look into Native American traditions of building uh, and uh, and how they lived, the the more amazing it becomes, and the, re re the more I realize how little I know, but I will pa <laughs> pass on <laughs> what, what I can. And I just wanted to mention that the show of the work of Joan Quick to See Smith opened at the Seattle Art Museum uh, at the weekend. And it's an absolutely phenomenal show, of, the, of which this is just a very small detail. But she is an absolutely amazing native uh, artist. Uh, and uh, please, please go, and I hope you enjoy it. Well, where do we start? We could start as if no Native Americans existed before the Mayflower arrived, or, or we could think about manifest destiny when we moved west uh, and uh, huge millions of people moved west and took possession of land which was not theirs. I will leave out the political aspects and concentrate on the building of the architects, of, of the Native Americans. Of course, what we know best are the teepees, and they illustrate how the builders built for their lifestyle. They were on the move, and so they wanted something that they could carry with them. But that's not all there is to native architecture. We will see many permanent structures. The teepee is an extraordinary uh, invention. Uh, it's very, very sophisticated in the way that uh, it deals with ventilation and changing wind directions. Uh, there's a pole which can move an opening at the top, uh, which can uh, let in uh, the right amount of air uh, and let out smoke from the central fire. We, I have found various uh, pictures uh, from the 19th century uh, showing gatherings around teepees. Uh, and we see uh, that often huge uh, co uh, congregations of people lived together, uh, and then they would move. So. The system was probably refined over uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, until the teepee came a really useful and adaptable dwelling. 
But there were many other uh, forms of dwelling, and one of them is the longhouse. Uh, this one doesn't show its length, uh, but it's there. And when we look inside, uh, we will realize that this is an amazing communal dwelling. If you thought that Indians, each Indian family had its own teepee wherever they went, that's not true. In many places, they lived in communal dwellings uh, where uh, they had a distinct social order uh, within, within the dwelling and amazing structures uh, that involved large tree trunks as well as smaller branches and uh, the interiors were arranged so that there were benches on which people slept along the walls and also for storing uh, their possessions. So here's another view uh, of uh, the storage areas of, uh, and sleeping areas of a longhouse. And you can see that in a way it's like a basilica with its central highest space and lower spaces on either side. Uh, the dividing into three with a dominant element is very common in architecture. So here uh, is one uh, partly constructed or partly uh, destroyed, perhaps, uh, showing how bark was used to cover it. Uh, sometimes other materials were used depending on what was available and the climate. Earth lodges appear in various forms in different parts of the country. Uh, and this, uh, this is a Mandan uh, earth lodge or group of Mandan earth lodges which were uh, built uh, in clusters with an open air for ceremonies in the middle. Um, you can see uh, there are great social occasions where uh, amazing uh, um, dances take place uh, and the roofs of the lodges even provide places for spectators. I find the 19th century uh, pictures uh, of the interiors. Uh, this is, I think this is by Charles Bodmer in the 19th century. Am I right, Susan? Yeah. Uh, so here is a space uh, that seems to have a social hierarchy. Uh, there's a seat in the middle for the most illustrious person. There's room for horses and uh, a hole for smoke for fires uh, to exit. And depending on the available materials, uh, there could be more or less or larger and smaller timbers. Uh, this is a really magnificent structure that must have taken enormous expertise uh, to erect. And another uh, standing view, this one uh, with a fireplace in the center, and you can see the opening in the roof uh, for the smoke uh, to go out. In the southwest, uh, there's another version of this, uh, the Hogan, uh, which uh, is similarly constructed and covered with earth. And then moving to the Northwest, there are very few remaining examples. Uh, this is a model in the museum in Victoria uh, of 
longhouses uh, announced by totem poles in uh, Haida Gwaii, uh, an island uh, many miles to, to the north off the coast of Victoria. Have any of you been to Haida Gwaii? It's, uh, I recommend it. It's one of the most marvelous places I've been. It required going by ferry up to Prince Rupert, where we left our car, and then we took a, a, a different boat that took us, for, it was about six hours out to Haida Gwaii. It used to be called the Queen Charlotte Islands. I don't believe that she, Queen Charlotte knew anything about it, whatever. Uh, but there is a community that's been there for thousands of years uh, and is very vibrant and full of artists carving totem poles. Unfortunately, many of my pictures are slides that I haven't had scanned, and so I don't have as much as I would like to show you uh, of Haida Gwaii. But there is a, a wonderful museum uh, there uh, which is constructed like a row uh, of longhouses uh, side by side uh, with totem poles uh, at their center. And they weren't, of course, open in this way. This is the way this has been built as a museum, uh, a splendid structure uh, with a view of the sea. So if you haven't yet been to the Queen Charlotte Islands or uh, Haida Gwaii as it's now known, uh, I recommend it. Moving south uh, to uh, northwest New Mexico, we come to an area where uh, at the top of this map is Mesa Verde National Park, uh, and uh, there is also Chaco Canyon down here, Bandelier National Monument. Uh, these are exciting places to visit. Uh, I've been to several of them, uh, some more than once, and I strongly uh, recommend it. This is a little bit difficult to see, uh, but the form of the map uh, probably helps you to imagine a great high mesa uh, with narrow valleys, and in these valleys are, are cliff dwellings. I'm sure some of you have been to, who's been to Mesa Verde? It's, it's one of the most exciting places I've ever been uh, to enjoy uh, indigenous architecture. So we're looking here at a cliff with sort of recesses, caved, recessed in them uh, at two levels, uh, which are filled uh, with stone buildings. Th this is a whole row of, uh, of cave dwellings, and we'll get much closer to them. Up on top of the mesa are, are more traditional uh, dwellings, and they all uh, have kivas to them, which are uh, subterranean spaces for ceremonial purposes. Uh, that, that now visitors can climb into. There's some that are there in Mesa Verde that you can climb into down a ladder. And of course, the ceremonies were secret, and so we don't know so much about them. Uh, but they appear in, s or versions of them appear in so many different uh, groups of Indian dwellings. Uh, there is uh, are some 
dwellings on top uh, with the kiva that's lost, lost its roof down below. And now we take a look uh, at the cliff dwellings, extraordinary places uh, with many family uh, homes, uh, um, uh, built together, and again uh, with kivas. There you can see that there's a kiva. There are some more over there. Uh, so they are for important for small groups uh, to have their own. Here's uh, a wonderful uh, view. If the, clay, if the cave roof was high, you could build a tower. Uh, if not so high, uh, you could squeeze into a small space under it. So I, uh, you can count five kivas there. Uh, so there must have been one uh, for each small group of dwellings. And they had a fire burning in the middle and then ledges around the outside. There's one that has lost its top. And how did the people get up and down? Well, this is provided for the tourists. <laughs> that's, that's how I got there. But they found little footholds in the cliffs and handholds, too. I, what I thought about when I was there, I was quite young when I was last there, but I thought about growing old in one of these places <laughs> and not being able to and they definitely didn't have these ladders because uh, intruders might come down them. But there were sort of uh, handholds and footholds up the cliff. And once you could no longer climb up and down, you were on that ledge in that cave for the rest of your life. <laughs> but it's easy for modern visitors. Another amazing place is Chaco Canyon. Glorious country with these great outcroppings of rock. Here, there was a permanent community that built durable structures out of stone and grew wonderful quantities of fruit and vegetables and uh, survived very well. Then, mysteriously, uh, about in the 17th century, I think, or a little later, uh, the settlement became depopulated. We don't know why. Anyone have any theories? Could be, could be loss of water. Uh, well, there were there were streams running through this. Uh, there are signs of where they used used to be. So there is a view down uh, onto a huge uh, half circle in shape uh, group of dwellings that rose several stories and surrounded a, uh, an area uh, with many kivas uh, sunken into it, and some of them had enormous kivas, not just for one small group, uh, but serving a, a much larger population. Some uh, groups of dwellings are, are far from the cliffs, others are closer, and they, they were several stories high divided into many compartments with these ceremonial spaces in front of them. It's absolutely astonishing uh, what they built. And we wish we knew more about how they lived and how they used the spaces. Very fine stonework 
uh, they had a method, uh, I think, you, oh. oh. I guess this is so. Oh, th this one, I think, shows you the closest uh, how uh, they had rows of larger flat stones uh, and then between them packed in many smaller ones. That's a very good question. Does anyone know the answer? So in another a group of dwellings high up above cliffs uh, are on pueblos in New Mexico. This is Acoma Pueblo uh, in uh, New Mexico, uh, dating from the 12th century. They've been there uh, for 900 years, if I've done my math right. And of course, they uh, were approached by missionaries and they built churches in some of the uh, pueblos. Uh, this is a fine example. I wish I had an interior picture. But going beyond mere dwellings, uh, there were mound builders in this country. Uh, they built settlements that were not unlike those in Mexico and Central America, but far in the north here. And they carried thousands and thousands of baskets of soil to build these great mounds. What possessed them to do it? Here is uh, a, re a reconstruction um, by an artist uh, using what evidence uh, was available to know about their dwellings, uh, some of which were high up on pyramids and may more have been temples. And moving beyond dwellings, uh, the most astonishing place I've never seen uh, is the Serpent Mound uh, in Ohio. Has anyone seen that? Oh, I want to know. Can you tell us about it? I c Well, it, it's a work of art, but it's obviously ceremonial, ceremonial in its purpose. And then I'm going to move on uh, from these settlements, about which I confess I know very little, uh, to some of the most recently built structures by native architects. Now, I don't know whether the architects here were native this is the Warm Springs Museum in Oregon. If you're going south through central Oregon, uh, it's easy to, to stop here and see it. Uh, and the architects from Portland created a structure which is unlike any, uh, it's not a replica of any Indian dwelling, but it's inspired by Indian dwellings and Indian crafts. We enter through uh, a great circle uh, enclosed by high curving walls and come up to uh, a doorway and then can uh, enter. And there are uh, motifs, decorative motifs on the brickwork which are actually responding to basket designs uh, that give them the, their character. Uh, there, were, there was no building like this, uh, to, to, to native, real native building to give inspiration 
but it's a wonderful place uh, to visit. Uh, and inside uh, is a structure that will, of a type that we'll see again in the work uh, of another architect, a sort of tree-like structure where a central pole branches out uh, to support the ceilings in various ways. Oh, have we? But he wasn't native. No. Ah, so you taught him everything he knew. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's very, it's very fine. If you're on your way south, uh, it's worth stopping here. But at, at Warm Springs, Oregon, we know, uh, we know someone. Uh, a native artist in in Portland, uh, whose family, some of whose family, uh, belongs to this tribe and have lived there. Her, her, her that, that's um, Lillian Pitt, who you may have come across, uh, a wonderful uh, native artist, and her brother is the leader of the Warm String Springs uh, tribe. Yes. <laughs> Closer to home is the Duwamish or Longhouse and Cultural Center on Marginal Way, uh, just a few minutes from here, and it's worth stopping. Uh, if you're going by, because there's always new things to see there. I wish I had taken a photograph. We were invited to a dinner there in this uh, wonderful interior. Uh, it doesn't, uh, this picture doesn't show what it's like, where it's full of people eating uh, delicious salmon and other Indian. All oh, right, yes, the Duwamish lost almost all their land, and they're not a recognized tribe, uh, which is very, very hard on them. But some people uh, have joined uh, in an organization that pays what is called real rent to Duwamish. Uh, you don't have to get very much to make a difference, give very much to make a difference. but we received immen immense hospitality and in uh, recognition of our little bit of support. At Christmas time, it's a good place to buy Christmas presents. They have all kinds of beautiful things uh, that they've made. Like so many tribes, uh, they have uh, artistic people in their company uh, who do wonderful things. Also close to home is Daybreak Star Cultural Center, uh, which is in uh, in the, what was, uh, what was the name of that military base? Fort, Fort Lawton, which became, uh, which was unused for after a while and it was a it was suggested that it should be given uh, as a place to build a native center, and Bernie White Bear uh, and others actually uh, occupied uh, the, an, an area and, and demanded it be given to them. I don't remember the story. Can, does anyone remember the story? It was it was a great Bernie White Bear. Uh, was one of the uh, main uh, native uh, leaders in in the Seattle area, and and they uh, got their way. And there is a street called White Bernie White Bear Way, uh, which leads to it. So this again is not 
a replica of an, an ancient Indian structure. Uh, it's an imaginary work. Uh, the Seattle native architect, uh, Bra um, yeah, what's his name? John Paul Jones, yes, I, I know his name very well. I just can't remember much these days. John, pa John Paul Jones came in on uh, the building of this. He w he he was not. I think he was not involved in the original planning, uh, but he was involved, and you'll be seeing uh, more buildings by him, including the Native Museum in Washington D.C. But this is a wonderful place to visit. I had the good fortune uh, to take it over for the wedding of one of my sons, who is part Indian, and uh, it was so exciting. Uh, to I don't even have a picture of the, the main space uh, where, where we met, but it's well worth visiting at any time. It's Well, then this is a bit different, but the, the, they, they really, Indian architects really knew how to use wood. So uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the spaces downstairs where you can really enjoy uh, huge columns and beams. Now, anyone know where this is? That, yes. I didn't put in a lot of labels, I'm afraid. Oh, it is written there. Many Indian tribes uh, in uh, Washington used to migrate to places where there were great meetings of tribes. And one of them was down beside the Columbia River uh, near Vancouver. And then a freeway and a railway were built, cutting off uh, Vancouver, Fort Vancouver and that area of the city completely from the river. And this is one of the proje projects in an amazing group of, I think, seven or eight uh, projects uh, along the Columbia River and other rivers uh, that started as a memorial. The idea was some sort of a memorial to Lewis and Clark, but it quickly became something quite different. Uh, would you like to say something, Susan? Susan gave a reading. I don't think many of you were at my reading. Were any of you at my reading? I talked about the land bridge and the extraordinary work of John Paul Jones there. But um, this is Henry's lecture. Well, when it was, uh, it was suggested uh, by the committee that was trying to make a memorial uh, to the Lewis and Clark expedition, a group of Indians went to her loft in Greenwich Village or somewhere in New York uh, and talked to her about it. And they said that what they needed was something that would memorialize the use of that land its early inhabitants, not just Lewis and Clark, who started uh, the movement west that, the, the, that was responsible for the losses. So they persuaded her to deal with the losses. The conference project is on seven sites along the rivers, each one 
has a different character. I think we should ask Susan to give a talk sometime about all of them, and we could produce uh, pictures uh, that, that would tell you a great deal more. I'm just showing you this one. The solution was to build a land bridge over the freeway uh, and so that people could cross the river uh, and uh, get, to, get to it, cross the, the freeway and get to its banks. And there were many Indian elders gathered there uh, for the opening. Uh, and here is the architect, John Paul Jones, uh, with Maya Lin, Maya Lin in the center, a lot shorter than John Paul Jones, and to the right, Susan. <laughs> oh, I, I should have a whole lot more pictures. Where have they gone? And <laughs> at the at the opening, there were huge crowds of people. Uh, there were also uh, people dressed uh, dressed in various uh, amazing ceremonial garments and also people walking on stilts and carrying high uh, extensions of their bodies into the sky. Uh, we'll, we'll arrange, we'll make sure that we can talk about this. It's one of the most exciting projects or group of projects uh, that, that I can think of. Yes. Oh, I was using that. It's on. Okay, I got it. If you read the label on the, on the uh, original sketch he showed you, one of the themes of the land bridge and the entire project by Maya Lin, the land bridge was mainly John Paul Jones, was the idea of native vegetation. And they had r brought in, yeah, you can see it here, pick up the terraces and native prairie, riparian vegetation, and carry the landscape systems up and over the highway. So that was a really important part of it. You should know, too, that Maya Lin was the architect for the Vietnam Memorial. <coughs> of yeah. course. Yes, we need to throw that in, because if you just say, have you heard of Maya Lin, we don't get a response. But if we say Vietnam Memorial, everybody knows that. Thank you. John Paul Jones. Uh, the Seattle native architect, also designed a cultural center for the Southern Ute tribe in Ignacio, Colorado. Uh, again, a contemporary native architect inspired by images that were in his mind uh, that uh, bring to life traditions, but with a lot of imagination too. So this uh, is a, uh, I think I'll start with the aerial view. It's a curving building with a high space in the middle. And that high space uh, is perhaps uh, like sort of a composite of various native structures. Uh, and then a plaza out in front uh, enclosed uh, by a wooden structure, and then it's part museum uh, and part cultural center. This is certainly a place that I would like to see. And at its center is this high space uh, with uh, a wonderful carving uh, in the style of totems uh, and Uh, and the space rises up, uh, sort of umbrella-like, uh, supported by a structure like one that we've seen uh, be before. So there's a lot of work going on uh, in, in various
various tribal areas uh, to create tribal centers that express the people's desires. One of them, John Paul Jones, was also one of the architects, I think the lead architect, involved in the National Native American, or I think it's called the National American Indian Museum in Washington, D.C. From one side, who's been there? Oh, quite a few, yes. Uh, on one side, uh, it stands up uh, tall. Uh, on the other side, it's behind trees. And unlike most of the museums uh, on the mall, uh, it's not approached by a grand flight of steps or standing free as, as, a, uh, as a monument on its own. As, as you approach it, you, you find yourself in a small scale, subtle uh, and evocative landscape that surrounds the building with curving paths and even a pool. Who would know that this was in the middle of Washington? And then paths lead around it, and we can see its undulating wall uh, again, inspired uh, by things that the architect sensed as having native expression. I love uh, the way that the wall undulates uh, and portions of it uh, overhang uh, lower areas. It's absolutely the opposite of the classical architecture of the typical Western, mu I mean, Western cultural, culturally museum. John and John, John Paul Jones was uh, one of the architects. Uh, I, I think there was some complicated story. Uh, about it. Uh, oh, thank you, Jane. Do you know his name? Can you tell us anything else about it? <laughs> it's it's really exciting. And I haven't yet, b I have, we've, we've been to this one, but I haven't yet been to the African American uh, Museum on the Mall, uh, which is, again, different from all the, uh, the, the others, a very, a very important structure. Yes? Oh, here, here it is. As you speak, it, it appears on the screen. Uh, it's, I, th I think this, this wonderful uh, series of concentric circles uh, is so inspiring. And uh, there are staircases that sort of emerge and pass through that space and then go out again. And there's a view down from uh, up there. And of course, there are all kinds of wonderful exhibits in it. And I remember having some very good Native American food. It was, an, uh, there was an excellent cafe. I didn't, again, my pictures were all slides and I couldn't uh, bring them to life. The, the, yes, the Northwest. Preston, Preston Singletary, the native artist, 
had a show there uh, that was uh, very successful. Well, as you have noticed, I don't know very much about this subject. I'm deeply fascinated. Uh, uh, okay. So I'm sure that a lot of you ha can add things that I didn't say and or ask questions which I may not be able to answer. Yes. I'm surprised you didn't mention the, I think it's called territorial architecture in New Mexico, which draws on the Pueblo, Pueblo tradition. And my, my cousin was an architect in Santa Fe, and all the buildings had to have, had to reflect that Pueblo, that Pueblo feeling. Yes, and, the, and there, were, there are some wonderful buildings in, in uh, Santa Fe and other places in, in the state uh, that I wish I knew more about. And I, I took pictures of some of them, but I, I only have slides. Yes. Thank you. Back to Maya Lynn. Uh, when Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center wanted her to design a fountain, the government wouldn't give out her contact information, and he called every Lynn in North uh, in New York City oh founder. And, and I've been there. Well, because it's private, I guess. And the other thing is at the Ma Museum of the American Indian, besides the f four kinds of cuisine, they had all kinds of housing you might remember. Some tribes were in teepees, some were in big long houses and so forth, and that was very interesting to see. Uh, two things. One is that I wondered in the longhouse how they obtained privacy. It seems almost impossible to imagine a private uh, ambience. The other thing I wanted to mention was with an, an inscription in the uh, uh, museum in D.C. It says that the thing that um, obliterated the Indian was the Winchester rifle and the Bible. And the smallpox blanket. Other questions? Bill. Uh, Bill. Bill. In the Chaco Canyon and other places, did they use any form of mortar to hold the stones together, or was it uh, just a matter of piling it up? They, I don't believe. I don't believe. I didn't see any sign of mortar there. Amazing. Amazing. Did Grant knows the answer? Really, really is. Grant. I don't, but I was going to mention Pueblo Benito. You didn't uh, talk about oh, that. Yes. The major structure in the south, the uh, great semicircle. That that's in Chaco Canyon, yeah. Yeah. Pueblo Benito. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, I mentioned this when you were talking about the Chicago architects, but you know, Chaco Canyon, I think it's Pueblo Benito, I mean, when it, before it uh, was eroded, was the tallest residential structure in the country until the elevator came to Chicago. That's a wonderful piece of information. Uh, did you all hear that? Pueblo Benito was the tallest residential structure in America. Jane. This is just a point of information. Uh, the, uh, the native house on the campus is called the Intellectual House, you know, on the university campus. Yes. And they meet in. Be very careful if you're ever going to get an Uber or Lyft uh, to give them an address. There is another Intellectual House. And uh, it's not anything in comparison. It's an old house just off of Aurora. And so <laughs> it was a very interesting experience. Uh, the, 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 the college was having their uh, scholarship things, their last uh, 
I guess it was, yeah, that was late, late spring or whatever it was. And so we went out to the intellectual house and ended up at this place. And the driver said, you're here. And we said, no, we're not in the right place. Now let us tell you how to get there. But be careful, be careful. There is another intellectual house and it's just an old house off of Aurora. So, okay, give an address, say the university campus, definitely, okay. And he, Susan, you went to a ceremony there recently, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, it's a beautiful space, beautiful. Yeah. Put the mic closer. Somebody Some of these smaller buildings remind me of the, of the Eskimo uh, houses that they have, and they're not their regular, they live in like they lived in Nome. But when they were caught outside in the wintertime, they would build up these blocks. They'd get blocks of hard snow and make igloos. And that was a place of, of uh, uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a refuge. A, exactly, as a refuge. Than, than no, it's colder than hell. <laughs> Bill? Oh, here, we've got two yeah, uh, one thing you didn't mention, Henry, is the astronomical aspect of so much of the Native American buildings. They were built along astronomical phenomena, to, you know, eclipses and stuff like that. And they're in Chaco Canyon, especially, it was a fantastic piece of astronomical architecture. Yeah, there there's, was a Native American movie that we saw recently that included the ref I think it was PBS included the astronomical aspect of it very good point anybody else well I I I just wanted to say that in this structure and Daybreak Star and the one in Warm Springs they primarily show contemporary native art and I think it's very important to make a note of that that's why I didn't want you to end with that basket because these, the contemporary native art scene is huge. And uh, I mean, witness Joan's uh, exhibition, but she also curated a show at the National Gallery with a hundred other native, contemporary native artists. So I think it's not only the architecture that's contemporary, but also what they curate inside of it. There's, there's a lecture for you in the future. <laughs> well, I think it's a really important thing to keep in mind to get our brains out of, you know, Indian art is old stuff. Right, we have a beautiful Preston Singletary in the. Is it in the lounge? Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah. And in our library here, there is a wonderful book of of Singletary um, works it with beautiful photographs, just stunning. I understand he just got another residency at the Museum of Glass, and the last one he did an incredible installation at the end of it about the story of Raven. So I'm looking forward to that. Any, any, other, any other comments or questions? Of course we have 100 questions, but we don't expect you to answer them all, <laughs> right? I mean, th this space right here is very provocative, isn't it? After you showed us all those kivas, I thought maybe it's a free form interpretation. What do you think, Henry? Maybe combines the ob obligatory dome with the kiva. I think that obligatory dome is a demonstration of colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> right? Why should they impose a dome on a native building? Yeah, right? Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Henry for stepping forward.